I'm Robert Pondicio with the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and Democracy Prep Public Schools, and I'm here to talk about what I call the 57 most important words in education reform. Let me start by saying that standards have never interested me very much. I'm a curriculum guy, and if there's one thing and one thing only that you need to know about standards, it's that standards are not a curriculum. This is not semantics. It's a crucial distinction. Consider, auto safety standards don't determine what kind of car you drive. Food safety standards don't tell you what to make for dinner. And Common Core ELA standards, crucially, don't tell you what to teach or what kids should read. You don't teach reading standards, you teach reading to the standards. And if there's one thing that I'd like you to know about reading, it's this. The reading is not a skill you teach, it's a condition you create. Let me explain what I mean by that. You probably think that reading is a skill, like riding a bike. Learn to ride a bike and you can ride any bike. Your ability transfers from one bike to the other. It's the same thing with reading, right? Once you learn how to read, you could read anything, can't you? Well, not really. There are two separate parts to reading. The first is decoding. That's a skill and a transferable skill, just like riding a bike. Let me prove it to you. I'll bet you could read this word out loud. It's turbot. Now I'll put an E in the end and the word changes. The word is now pronounced churbite. But see, neither turbot or churbite are real words. I just made them up. But we all agree how to pronounce these made-up words. That's because there's a written code to our language that you can learn, practice, and master. That's decoding. That's a skill. And it's a transferable skill. You can apply it even to words you've never seen before. But here's the problem. Reading comprehension is not a skill. Reading comprehension, the ability to make meaning from words, is not a skill, but we teach it and test it like one. You see, reading is what cognitive scientists would call domain-specific. You need to know a little bit about the subject, sometimes a lot about it, to make sense of what you read. You've seen this if you've ever taught struggling readers. You've heard them say, I read it, but I didn't get it. What that means is that the student can decode a text, but they don't fully comprehend it. So why does that happen? And why is it so hard to address? Visit an elementary school where struggling kids are learning to read anywhere in America. I will virtually guarantee you that you'll see teacher-created posters in every classroom in child-friendly language that say things like this. Good readers ask questions. Good readers create pictures in their minds. Good readers make connections when they read. Watch reading teachers in action. You'll see them doing think-alouds, reading to students, and stopping frequently to ask themselves questions out loud. Why do they do this? Well, the teachers are modeling the habits of good readers. We teach kids what good readers do, then we ask them to practice on books they choose themselves until they become good readers too. That's the theory. I have a name for this theory. I call it cargo cult reading. The physicist Richard Feynman once wrote about cargo cults. He described these primitive tribes on occupied islands in the South Pacific. During World War II, they saw these airplanes land and lots of great stuff came out of the planes. Food and clothing and supplies. Then the war ended, the soldiers went away, and the planes stopped coming. The tribesmen wanted the planes to come back, so they built runways and signal fires alongside of them. They built control towers. They sat inside those towers wearing helmets with sticks like antenna coming out of the sides. They even made planes out of bamboo, decoys to attract new planes. It sounds ridiculous, right? But this is what they saw the soldiers do during the war, and it worked perfectly. The soldiers had modeled the habits and behaviors that brought planes from the sky. The cargo cults learned, practiced, and mastered those skills. They learned what good soldiers do to make the planes land, and they practiced it. But it didn't work. Obviously it didn't work, because something essential was missing. It's the same thing in reading. Something essential is missing. You see, it's not enough to teach children what good readers do. We must also teach them what good readers know. Your ability to make meaning from a text is not a skill that you can practice and master directly. It's not a skill at all. To a significant degree, reading comprehension is a reflection of the amount of knowledge and vocabulary you have. Reading is how you get more knowledge and more vocabulary. But there's a paradox. You need knowledge and vocabulary to get more knowledge and vocabulary. And that's why it's so hard to raise reading scores. You see, math is hierarchical. Addition comes before multiplication, division comes before percents and ratios, but reading isn't hierarchical, it's cumulative. What that means is virtually everything a child sees and hears and learns in and out of school contributes to language proficiency. The term the Matthew effect has been used to describe what happens when some kids come to school with smaller vocabularies and less general knowledge than their peers. The name comes from a passage in the biblical gospel of Matthew. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. In plain English, it means the rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer. 
The Matthew effect means those who are knowledge and language poor in early childhood will get poorer and fall further behind, while the knowledge and verbally rich will get richer. Because knowledge builds on knowledge, language builds on language, words build on words. How do we learn new words? Not by studying vocabulary. A typical college freshman has a working vocabulary of about 60,000 words. Let's do the math. To learn that many words by age 18, you'd need to learn 10 words a day. That's 70 words a week. That's 3,300 words a year. And that's assuming that you learn 10 words while you're still in the delivery room and 10 more every day until freshman year of college. Now clearly nobody learns or memorizes 10 new words a day. So where does all that language growth come from? Well, let me show you. Here's a word some of you may know, but most probably do not. Remember, because we're all pretty good decoders, we can read the word excrescence, but do you know what it means? Well, maybe you'd have a better idea if I gave it to you in a sentence. To calculate fuel efficiency, aerospace engineers needed an accurate estimation of excrescence drag caused by the shape of the plane's cabin. Not helping? Here's another one. Excrescences on the valve of the heart have been known to cause a stroke. Now, maybe you have a vague understanding of the word now. Let me give you one more sentence so you can check your understanding or refine your definition. The wart, a small excrescence on his skin, had made Jeremy self-conscious for years. All right, now you probably have a very solid understanding of the word. One more sentence to verify it. At the far end of the meadow was what at first glance I thought was a huge dome building and then saw was an excrescence from the cliff itself. You've probably figured out, if you didn't already know, that an excrescence is a projection or outgrowth, especially when abnormal. This is an accelerated example of how our word learning occurs. The general sense you get of a word from encountering it gets narrowed down every time until it becomes part of your working vocabulary. But here's the important part. Think of all the words and knowledge you already had that enabled you to learn that new word, excrescence. You know about engineers and strokes and warts. You didn't have to stop and wonder what the words fuel efficiency and aerospace and self-conscious meant. You're already rich in knowledge and vocabulary, and you just got a little richer. If you didn't know those things, you just fell a little further behind. That's the Matthew effect. This is profoundly important. It gets to the heart of our struggle to improve reading comprehension and grow verbal ability, especially for children who come from low-income, language-poor, knowledge-poor homes. And it leads directly to why Common Core state standards are important. Frankly, for me, it's not about text complexity, Lexile scores, or close reading. Common Core matters because of 57 words. These 57 words. By reading texts in history and social studies, science and other disciplines, students build a foundation of knowledge in these fields that will also give them the background to be better readers in all content areas. Students can only gain this foundation when the curriculum is intentionally and coherently structured to develop rich content knowledge within and across grades. I've described this passage from the Common Core ELA standards as the most important 57 words in education reform since a nation at risk. Why? Because this is not happening in schools right now. Common Core, understood and implemented well, represents a profound shift from a skills-based vision of literacy to a content-based vision of literacy. We talk a lot about the various instructional shifts under Common Core. This, I think, is the most important one. In fact, let me boil these 57 words down to just nine. If you're not building knowledge, you're not teaching reading. Reading is not a skill that you teach, it's a condition you create. And you create that condition not by practicing and mastering reading strategies, but by ensuring our most disadvantaged children get as much science, history, geography, art, music, and literature as possible. If you cut those things to make more time to practice reading, you're doing it wrong. Knowledge is literacy. Think of a reading passage as something like a game of Jenga. A tower of blocks in which every block is a bit of background knowledge or a vocabulary word. You can pull out a few blocks and it'll still stand up. Pull out one too many and the entire thing collapses. They read it, but they don't get it. Common Core or no Common Core, every teacher in every elementary school must understand that without imparting a coherent, knowledge-rich, language-rich ELA curriculum, which Common Core can't even mandate but merely recommends, most of our children will not meet any meaningful standard.